Hello, everybody. And uh, welcome this morning. It's such a gorgeous morning to be talking about gorgeous books with an amazing audience. I'm loving the fact that it's going to fill up because uh, we have incredibly talented, incredibly valuable assets <laughs> of the literary world on stage here with me. I'd like you to present to you Grace Nichols, uh, whose passport to here and there is the latest book by this prolific and acclaimed Guyanese writer and playwright, and the most recent recipient of the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. Her first collection, I Is a Long Memoried Woman from 1983, won the Commonwealth Poetry, Poetry Prize. Now that, that's <laughs> Grace's, sorry, Grace. <laughs> I beg your pardon, this is Grace, please. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Jenkins is the person I was misnaming there. Uh, her memoir, The Stranger Who Has Myself, is the Trinidadian author's latest book. Her debut novel, The Writer's Place, was shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature Christopher Bland Prize. And that's Barbara. Hello. Hi. <clears throat> and Ira Mather is the debut author of Love the Dark Days, it's a memoir about the emotional ruins of the empire on three generations of women set in Trinidad, St. Lucia, India, and Britain. And its book ended by a weekend with, De uh, with Derek Walcott. Welcome to you all, and thank you so much. You. Now, I kind of terrified the, the organizers of this um, meeting and this gathering by telling them that I had no idea where to start with anything because there was so much and, and so many questions just tumbled out of my brain as I, was as I was reading your books this week. And can I just say that the books are very, very beautiful books, beautiful artifacts, beautiful, usable, tangible objects that you can see and smell and, and, and handle. So buy them, don't kindle it. These are beautiful books to have in your house. Um, so I'm going to start actually by asking Grace to read a little bit about uh, uh, poetry. We're gonna start with poetry because the three books written that we're discussing this morning are essentially broadly called life writing because they're memoir. And they describe epic journeys that were taken by the three people that you see sitting here. And they've written about those. And we've all taken epic journeys, I think, just looking at the faces in this room our families, our ancestors have taken epic journeys to bring us all here. And we're going to find the connections between us in the books that we're going to be hear, hearing about today. And we're going to start with Grace's poetry. Grace? Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here as part of this great literary festival that's called Bocas. And uh, the theme, broadly speaking, uh, as I was told, is displacement and homelands. So uh, I'll try to relate what I say, my poems, uh, to that. Uh, I was going to begin by reading from my latest book, Passport to Here and There, but I feel this particular poem uh, touches on the heart of migration and displacement and home. What's home? Because like migration, and home are like two sides of the same coin. And uh, when you leave your homeland, you leave because of something. In our case, myself and the poet John Agard, my husband, uh, we left because we wanted to become uh, professional writers and to live off of our writing. And Guyana, uh, though I love Guyana dearly, had no publishing house and there was no way you could make a living as a writer. So England, uh, you know, Guyana was a British colony, seemed the very, you know, the obvious choice. And this particular poem, I think, touches on a variety of feelings uh, in, in a psychic way, like, you know, displacement and your longing for home. Uh, at the same time, you know, you, you know you need to be here to be able to make a living. And I guess when I first came here nearly 44 years ago, 
uh, it wasn't with in my I didn't have in mind even staying in England. I didn't, you know, I just came. I just followed John. <laughs> uh, and I came here and I felt, you know, maybe I'll be here for a few years. But I'm, I'm still here. And this particular poem was written a few years after coming when sometimes people might ask me, are you going to go back home? Are you staying in England? So the poem tries to answer that question. And uh, a line in the poem uh, was inspired by the famous song by Sam, Sam Cooke, Where Have I Hang My Hat? Uh, that's my home. So I use that line in this poem. And it touches on our you know, need for going where, you know, psychically we feel we can flourish and make a living. It's called Wherever I Hang. I leave my people, my land, my home, for reasons I'm not too sure. I forsake the sun and the hummingbird splendor and pick up my new world self and come to this place called England. At first, I feel in like I in dream. The misty grayness are touching the walls to see if they're real. They solid to the seam. And the people pouring from the underground system like beans. And when I look up to the sky, I see Lord Nelson high, too high to lie. And if so, I sending home photos of myself among the pigeons and the snow. And if so, I warding off the cold. And if so, little by little, I come to change my calypso ways. Never visit, never visiting nobody before giving them clear warning and waiting my turn in queue. Hmm. Now, after all this time, I still get accustomed to the English life. But I'm still Miss Back Home side. To tell you the truth, I don't know really where I belong. Yes, divided to the ocean, divided to the bone. Wherever I hang my knickers, that's my home. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's dealing with migration in a very, yeah, in a very complex way, but put humorously. Yeah. You, you do it with, with great ease, the sense of moving from one place to the next. And it, it was a choice for you to come here, right? To, to, to move here. Uh, so it wasn't a, a forced um, migration, as it were, as it was for you, uh, Ira, for instance, because you came as a, you, you, you went to, 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 to Trinidad as a child. But I'm just touching on the different ways in which people moved. I came here about 20 years ago, and in my mind, it was also a choice. <laughs> And, and Barbara, you came as a, as, as a, as a, as a student, student teacher yes, to, to yeah. come. But there's a backdrop of huge events that, that happen that we don't actually see when we're leaving. So Grace, did you feel like that you were part of a migration or did you feel like it was an individual choice that you were making? Yes, it felt like part of a greater migration because so many Caribbean people and people from Guyana have moved on, you know, whether it's the USA, Canada, different parts of the Caribbean or England. So I think it's a kind of part of the restless type of spirit of Caribbean people that we have, that, you know, we go for one reason or another, uh, and we create a new home where we find ourselves. And in terms, we help to change the place that we're in through, you know, uh, uh, you know, contributing to the culture, mm -hmm. while at the same time we are changed as people by that culture. And then in terms of diversity, you know, more and more faces. Uh, in our case, we live in Sussex. And when we first moved there, about three months after living in England, we were like the only black faces or mixed race faces around. But gradually you began to see more and more people also settling in Sussex. 
So, but at the same time, it was a conscious individual choice of, because both, uh, both myself and John worked at one of our national newspapers as journalists. And so, you know, we had that background in any case and had already started writing like poems and fiction. So when we came here, it was specifically to be published and to develop as, as writers because we couldn't really do that in Guyana. Yeah. But I constantly go back because I still have a brother and a sister who lives uh, back in Guyana. Yeah, um, the coming and going, I wonder, because I, you find yourself, and there's a, one of your poems you write about how grounded you become here, and the grounding becomes because, of, because you have a child and, and you're sort of here now. Yeah. And then there's a point at which when you're at, when you're, sort of back home in your back home mind, yeah. where you're thinking, actually, here too. Yes. Those yeah. moments. I remember for me it was, and it was, I, felt, I felt like I was betraying South Africa when I did that. It was when I re was in, in Johannesburg, beautiful sunny day, eating mangoes, mangoes with salt. Barbara, yes. you are my tribe. Yes. <laughs> I, I, it was when I, when I was missing the variety of tomatoes that you could get here. And this was only because it was in the last 10 years or so, not in the early 90s when I first came. And I suddenly thought, I'm a traitor because I'm relinquishing something from home and missing something from here. Did it ever feel like that to you? Yes, and I think this little poem I'll read for you uh, quickly illustrates that because uh, the last time I was home, and it was about five years ago, and I love Buxton Spice Mangoes. Yes. Yeah. It's very special. <laughs> Guyanese mango. There, there's no other mango like, like that. I'm sure other parts of, of, of the Caribbean have their be own special mangoes. And uh, I, I think I had eaten and then she gave me a, a big mango. And uh, I think this illustrates something of that because I do feel I have two homelands in a way. When I'm in Guyana, England becomes my home, mm. you know. And when I'm in here, Guyana is my home, and the wider Caribbean. So it's simply called Apple and Mango. When last home, trying to recover some of the bright light of my childhood days, my sister threw me the sudden gift of a Buxton Spice Mango. I remember how I peeled and sliced that plump orb of sunshine, adding a sprinkling of salt the way I liked it as a child. I remember how she raised her eyes when I said I leave back for afters a slice. Girl, you can't finish one mango? <laughs> how could I have admitted that I had to save back space for the fruits of my other back home. This rain and winter driven blighty, where summery strawberry and apple and my daughters all grow. Aww. So it just shows the, yeah. mm. the complexity, you know what I mean? As you say, at times you feel a bit guilty, you get to love the landscape you're in also, mm -hmm. like the Sussex landscape where I live. Uh, the beautiful dungs and the white cliffs and, you know, you love that landscape, but you feel almost as though, as you say, you're betraying your homeland a bit by loving another place. Yeah. Equally. I'd like to carry on just a, a little bit longer with this, and please, uh, we can answer each other, yes, if, mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to add to this as well. Because the response of people from home to your being there, I feel like they're slightly punitive, you know, that they, they, want to, they punish you slightly for, for leaving. So my, my brothers, for instance, taunt me about the weather here. You know, like, oh, it's so awful. You know, it's, it's, it's sunny here and all of that. And sometimes I just feel like saying, well, listen, uh, we've got regular lights here. There's no water shedding, you know. The, the, <laughs> I feel it's really cruel to do that. <laughs> but I had, to, yeah. I had to clap back at some point because I was made to feel so guilty about that. I want to ask you, did, um, did you, did you feel that way? I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, you, you can, you know, answer. Yeah, I, I'm finding so many parallels 
with Grace's experience. Having left Trinidad in 1962 on actually Independence Day, the 31st oh, wow. of August, mm -hmm. it wasn't planned like that. Independence was announced after I had bought my ticket. But mm -hmm. I was coming here for a specific period of time. Mm -hmm. I was coming here for three or four years to do a degree on a government scholarship to go back home and teach. Well, 10 years later was when I finally went back, when I was, when I was made to go back uh, or find somehow the investment that the government had made in my further education to pay back my scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a, a real choice about going back. And as Grace was saying, you grow to love your new place mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. I was at Aberystwyth at university and then later at Cardiff. I had got married to a fellow student mm -hmm. and by then I had a small child who was as Welsh as any child in Cardiff, born in 1969. Mm. And we were very happy there. There was no reason for me to feel that I belonged anywhere else. Mm. There, at that time, of course, there was no connection. You had to go to a red phone box to make an overseas call yeah. to speak to family back home. Mm -hmm. So that the day-to-day -day connection that I now easily have with my scattered family mm -hmm. did, did not happen and it created a huge distance between my Trinidad life that I had left and the life in Wales that I was loving. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good time, I think, for us to, to hear a, a, a reading from you. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I did not start by saying, as I should have, how wonderful it is to be here. So I'm going to do that now. <laughs> it's appropriate, actually, that I am in this space. For, this, for the last time I was in the UK several years ago, and I was here to see the Windrush exhibition. Mm. So it's quite fitting that my return marks that epic journey that you spoke about earlier, Audrey. And the book is called The Stranger Who Is Myself because part of the, part of the, the person that I am now arrived here after an epic journey of self. Who I am now is not who I was always, I hope I have grown and I hope I have somewhat improved over time, like good wine. But um, so I'll tell you how awful I was some time ago. <laughs> and this is about my return to Aberystwyth after my first Christmas in the UK, which I spent in London with Trinidadian friends. But going back to Abba was going back to my, the world to which I had become accustomed. So here we go. I went back to Abba and heard talk that the sea had frozen over Christmas. The record for the lowest temperature in that part of Wales had been broken. And throughout Britain, it turned out to be one of the bitterest winters on record. I also found that a box for me had been delivered to Alexandra Hall. Mommy had got a cardboard box, maybe from the shop across the road, and packed it, sealed it with tape around every edge and across every opening. Then she wrapped it all in brown paper and taped that up too. It took a full 10 minutes to open it, and when I did, for the first time in the more than four months of gradually shedding my old life and slowly adapting to the new space, I was yanked back home and I sat on the floor and cried. Mommy had sent black cake, sorrel liqueur and poncho creme. I could see her soaking the dried fruit in cherry brandy and rum, 
in the big stoneware jar for months in advance for the cake, tearing the red fleshy sepals from the prickly seed pods of sorrel and steeping the sepals in rum to draw out the color and flavor, straining it after some weeks and bottling the heady liqueur, whipping a dozen eggs into a foam with a length of lime peel to cut the eggy smell, and adding to it condensed milk, evaporated milk, and rum for the punch of creme, and pouring the mixture into a rum bottle and corking it tight, tight. She'd wrapped each bottle in layers of newspapers because it had a long way to go in the hold of a heaving ship, and packed them one by one in the box more newspapers crunched between the bottles. She would have checked the date for the last parcel post to England and had got someone to drop her and the box to the post office, Mommy hugging the box on her lap, Mommy thinking of me, but unable to visualize what I looked like, what I'd be wearing, where I'd be, and what there looked like. But maybe imagining my face, my joy at receiving the reminders of home and proof of her love and her thoughtfulness. I pulled each bottle out of the box, unwrapped it, the ruby red sorrel liqueur, the creamy punch of creme. I opened the tin and smelled the black cake. Then I put everything back in the box, closed the flaps, pushed the box under my bed. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want it to be seen. A cardboard box begged from a grocery, the brown paper wrapping, the newspapers, the badly cut or torn tape of different colors and kinds, the address in ballpoint written in capitals, once, then over again, though not exactly on the first letters, and overwritten again to thicken the letters to make them more visible. An address of seven lines. Barbara Laffel, Room 60, Alexandra Hall, University College of Wales, Aberystwyth, Wales, United Kingdom. If there had been more space, I guess the next line would have read, the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the things inside, how could I explain the contents when the idea of difference as a positive wasn't on the horizon of a yet-to-be-imagined imaginary? When things not familiar were scorned, things foreign, food foreign, you held your nose at, even European things, the smell of garlic was thought of as repulsive as smelling of bodily waste. So how could I share what had arrived, my homemade fair with my friends? It was true that everyone shared whatever they had brought from home after weekends away. Welsh cakes, Victoria sponge, lava bread, fudge, but those were their things things that already occupied cultural common ground. A place in conversation, in books, in films, things you could compare. My mother's Victoria sponge with yours, my grandma's sponge with yours. How would my mother's homemade fare fit? How credible a comparison with black cake and an old biscuit tin make with Christmas pudding of Christmas carols of Charles Dickens. This was pudding lifted out of a steamer, unveiled from its mesh bag to expose a light brown dome plump with preserved fruit, decorated on top with an artificial holly berry and leaf cluster, and placed in the center of a royal Dalton oval dish at whose side rests a purpose-designed pudding slicing tool a little trowel-like object, one edge serrated, one smooth. And next to it, a jug of whipped cream or brandy sauce. In the case of Pancha Creme, 
how do I explain condensed milk? Mm. I was ashamed, ashamed of home, of my mother's efforts, which cost her so much, but seemed so pitiful here. That Christmas offering, whose primitiveness I had shoved under the bed. Nothing was up to the sophistication, the civilization of what I thought I had merged into. I couldn't bear to think of where I had come from, who I really was, could, if others saw this box, be so easily, so irrefutably exposed. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I, I feel like I can barely breathe mm -hmm. from that reading because I imagine it's a process that so many people go through, the process of othering yourself, despising yourself. Mm -hmm. And the fact that from on the outside, the outside doesn't care, it demands it almost. Did you feel it demanded it or did you feel that, or did you demand it of yourself? I don't know. I think that shame is something that victims take, victims take upon themselves, which is why girls who are raped or boys who are raped do not come forward and say it. They somehow feel that they are in some way culpable. And, and there is also in the Caribbean, or there was when I was growing up, not so now, uh, a denial of Africanness, of Africa being part of the heritage. Girls at school would say, girls who look like me would say, I'm, I have Portuguese, I have Chinese, I have Indian, but they will, in me, but they won't say, I have African in me, because Africa was associ associated not only with backwardness, but it was associated with enslavement. And if you were a slave for 400 years, something has got to be wrong with you. Mm. So that Africa was a space of denial and shame was our portion of people of African descent. So when we came to the mother country. The mother Britain, country, it always strikes me that country, the mother country. Yes, we came with a sense of being part of this so that you learned to ape the habits of this country and to be ashamed of anything that was not like this. So the Christmas pudding was the epitome of a Christmas vine, fruit, uh, alcohol infused um, dessert. Mm. And black cake was somehow inferior. Mm. So it's a generational thing, I'm happy to say. Mm. I know that my own children have a sense of being West Indian, uh -huh. Caribbean, yeah. mm. which came to me much later. Mercifully, I'm living to tell the tale. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> because you describe, in, in essence, being a stranger in a familiar land uh, and, and sort of denying all. And when you went back, though, yes. when I think it's your husband describes the house that you're going to move into yes. as exquisite. Yes. You look at him, it's like, what are you talking yeah, exactly, about? Exactly, exactly. So was that the beginning of a reawakening of yourself? Oh, but it was such a privilege, actually, to be allowed to see my space through somebody else's eyes, somebody whose position and privilege as being born British, brought up in all of this civilization, and who came I think we should Trinidad. be like civilization. Yeah, ex oh, mm. civilization. Um, and, and who came to Trinidad and was absolutely blown away by the culture of Trinidad. Um, he used to work at town and country planning, which at the time was in uh, two old buildings. I think there were American um, Air Force, 
uh, hospital things in the center of town. And at that time, All Stars Steel Band had been displaced from Heliard on Duke Street. I see Trini's nodding, man. Okay, great. Had been displaced from there onto what was then called Marine Square. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to practice during the day. And he would leave his office, cross the road, just to listen to the steel band. Now, I left home with steel band, it was, yeah, some fellas playing pan kind of thing. Making a noise. But when I <laughs> saw how transfigured he was, I, I yeah, I, I took on an appreciation. He taught me through his alien eyes to love and appreciate my own home. And it was, like I said, a real gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Ira Martha, you were a child when you were forcibly, <laughs> I'll say forcibly because children have no choice in these things, taken from India and brought to Trinidad. So you were a stranger in a strange land and you literally landed in a very, very strange environment where as soon as your, you and your grandmother come out of this, uh, 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 at the airport, your mother, your grandmother, who's a very, very formidable kind of woman, <laughs> very formidable, you will meet yes. her. We know women like that, all of us. Mm. She commands some man, some young man to come and fetch her bags and, and he, she calls him, I can't say that word without flinching and I know that there are people who can't hear the word without flinching. She calls him the C word, basically. Yeah. And, 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 and he says, we don't talk like that here, but I'll still help you. I mean, I mean, so immediately there's an introduction into this whole new world that you don't understand and you're forced to be in. Tell us a little bit about how that immediately catapults you into a world. Like, how do you cope? How do you manage? Because you're a child. I think, um, and my father was in the Indian Army. So we were so used to going from place to place in India. And because my mother was Muslim, is Muslim, my father's Hindu, the army was the only place where we kind of belonged because we didn't really belong anywhere else in India because all the army officers, they all spoke English instead of the 27 languages of India. So we were so used to going from maybe the Himalayas and Simla where there was snow all year round and we have peaches in winter and we skated to very sweltering heat of Madras or Bombay or to move to Delhi. So we were used to different languages. And we, like people, we were already kind of displaced because of how my parents married, uh, you know, in post-independence India, but one Muslim and, and a Hindu. Uh, of course, my mother was disinherited because of that. But when we went to Trinidad, I thought we were going to America, actually. So, um, so we, my impression, and I'm so happy I went there as a child, because I didn't have any knowledge of the brutal history of slavery, of indentureship. So my feeling about hitting Trinidad and seeing that blast coming out of the plane and seeing that light, that Caribbean light, and the first thing we saw, and I'll read a little piece of that, the light of the ocean, it really, really, it gives me pause. I felt like I landed somewhere magical. Read for us then. <laughs> so I'll read you a little bit as, um, as we leave Bangalore. But I want to just say here that um, this is also a book, a post-colonial book about privilege. And it's about Trinidad, the new world, which in a sense is a magical world because it's strands of so many continents. And we've left behind uh, the old pecking orders. So my grandmother from a very old India with very strict pecking orders now collides with a new world where I guess in a sense Trinidadians have always had a very strong sense of our dignity and who we are as human beings. So she collides with a housekeeper in Trinidad and that's what I'd like to read to you. Oh yeah, that's I an mean. epic fight, <laughs> that. <Yeah. laughs> Imagine that. Angel and I start crying as the piano is taken away by four men, leaving only the piano stool with the sheet music inside it. Kaja hugs Angel, tears falling into Angel's dark hair, her frail hands around Angel's waist. Don't cry, girls. Pop it, Angel, don't cry. Only two days, then we fly. Only two days, then we fly, says Angel, 
in Barimami's voice, breaking free from Kaja. She starts running, her chubby fingers making piano-playing movements in the air as she wades into the old brocade curtains from Majid Castle that have been locked in a trunk since 1947. I'm surprised to see the tears in Barimami's eyes when the ayahs line up to say goodbye to us. She hands them little envelopes with money. Don't worry, you can stay here. You'll get a monthly salary. Just don't give it to your damn men. Angel is shouting, fairy dust, fairy dust. She's spinning in circles in the curtains, watching with shrieking delight the brocade disintegrate into bejeweled smoke as it spread into the rooms and floors out of the windows. Oh God, Mama's curtains falling apart in bits, the last of Majid Castle. Mama, Papa, all gone, gone. Our laughter smothers her wail as she draws our faces close to hers. I can't tell if Bari Mami is laughing or crying, blinded by the swirling, ascending dust. Briefly, 17 Rest House Road is a goblet of electric blue light. We're leaving Rest House Road for the airport, our suitcases strapped on the top of the taxi. We stare through the black window until the house is out of sight. Barimami looks straight ahead, wearing oversized sunglasses. She puts Angel on her lap and says, don't be sad, darling, everything will be the same when we return. We're going on an adventure, on an island. We will go to the seaside. Would you like that, my darlings? Angel puts her thumb in her mouth. We would go anywhere with Barimami. If she can leave 17 Rest House Road behind, so can we. Maybe, finally, we could be a proper family with all of us together. Barimami sings, Just pop it in me, and Angel makes three. Together we'll be in our sweet heaven. In Bombay, we stay at the Taj, where the managers seem to know Barimami well. Angel and I are open-mouthed at this, at Barimami, in imposing black silk and pearls, with her usual crimson lipstick, Pan exchanged for cigarettes with a long holder, commanding even here, amidst the gleaming marble floors, high ceiling, and unending stairwells. She smokes, crossing and uncrossing her legs, telling hovering liveried berries, bearers to heat her milk, take this away, bring that, crumpling fine linen as casually as if she did this every day. One evening, she tells a pianist she'd like to play, and as if there was no one there, no tourists, no strangers, in that plush Victorian tea room with the view of India Gate and the ocean, she plays some Bach, always that Brandenburg concerto, and closes with Dr. Zhivago, her eyes closed. In India, we'd heard that London was always damp with a cold that got into your bones. I wanted to know how that felt, but we landed in London to stifling heat, Nothing like Bangalore, cool all year round. The streets looked ordered and bare. The city as magical as a storybook. Harrods, Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, the Thames, Buckingham Palace, Hyde Park, the Victorian Albert Museum. Barimami points them out from the taxi in the day and at night when she takes us around the city. I'm going to cut a little bit and move ahead to Tobago part. The passengers on the plane from London to Port of Spain look to me like South Indians, but darker. I'm confused, questioning. South Indian women have long plaits coiled with oil and jasmine. They wear bright silk saris. But these women have short hair and wear dresses. It's because they are African, darling, Barimami pronounces. See, their hair is so thick and curly. Like mine, asks Angel. No, theirs is thicker. Angel sets up her face as if she wants to cry, but Barimami is too distracted to comfort her, so she puts her thumb in her mouth instead. At Piaco Airport, we walk out of the aircraft into a heat so powerful we're pushed backwards, then the blast from the aircraft engines throws us forward into a furnace. In the carousel area, Barimami beckons to a dark, thin young man of Indian descent to pick up our bags, and carry them through. She says, that well, word. it's in that word. You, I mean, uh, I, I, I personally it's in the wouldn't, book. You, I don't know. 
Okay. The convention. Take those bags. I've got no money to give you, but my son-in-law is outside. He will pay you. Nah, he says, I'm not an attendant. I'm a medical student. We don't use that word here, madam. But mummy looks confused. He helps us anyway. We enter, we enter a chaotic customs hall with a long raggedy queue. Bari Mami goes straight up to the top of the queue, but the customs officer points for her to go back. My granddaughters are very tired. Everybody tired. You can't break the line. Go back. Mm. People sh sh throw us curious looks, but Bari Mami doesn't notice. What did you say? I don't understand you. Look, lady, just go back. The officer points to the long line, but she waits beside him, sighing until some kind people let us go to the front of the line. The customs officer eyes her doubtfully. You come for a holiday? Absolutely not. I'm here to meet Colonel Vaidnath. His daughters are my wards. Well, call it what you want. You know you can't stay for more than three months, right? <laughs> Don't be impertinent, young man. I'm a guest in your country. He shrugs and lets us through. On our way out, she pushes past the crowds impatiently. Let me through. The children are tired. Let me through, please. I'm relieved to see Daddy's deeply tanned, handsome face in the crowd coming towards us, his white teeth glinting. He gets us through formalities and takes us onto the tarmac, <clears throat> where we climb into a small helicopter, a perk we take for granted, the hot wind throwing grit in our eyes. I'm exhilarated as we fly jumpily through faint wisps of candy floss clouds. The sea is a slate grease, gray slab of thrilling, dangerous, choppy water. I'm going to move ahead to the part when the housekeeper comes. The first housekeeper. The first, of many. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to give a brief description of what we saw in Tobago. Angel and I follow Barimami outside, squinting at the glare of the already hot day, at the curve of the bay. We taste briny air and look around. The back of our house faces the edge of a plateau that slopes into a guava orchard. The front looks over a valley. To our left, on a vast expanse of lawn, dotted with hibiscus and bougainvillea, there are four cannons, their muzzles neatly slotted into the wall, pointed at the ocean. Barimami sounds like a general exploring territory. Look, we're on a fort. Come on, let's go and look at the cannons. She leads us off. I stroke the smooth black cannon and look at the dazzling ocean. I've never seen anything this bright. The sky, the sea, the air. Barimami reads the plaque. This fort was built by Sir Thomas Hislop and named after King George III in 1804 to secure the colonial territories from foreign invasions and prevent internal revolts from the slaves. A heavy woman approaches slowly, her floral dress whipping around her legs. As she reaches the door, Mummy says, oh look, it's Beulah, thank God you're here. Beulah breathes heavily by the front door where we are now congregated. She looks very Mummy up and down, then brushes past her with a morning. Enraged, Bari Mami opens her mouth to chastise her. Mami whispers urgently in Urdu, Don't say anything, mother. She won't like it. We look on aghast as Beulah sits at the table and serves herself breakfast. Bari Mami says in Urdu to Mami, This is unheard of for a servant in India. Mami says dryly, This is not India, my dear. <laughs> Beulah, unaffected by our staring, calmly sets about con consuming half a loaf of bright white bread and butter, washing it down with a fizzy orange soft drink mince, mixed with condensed milk. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Mummy approaches her tentatively, sweat on her upper lip. Do what you can, uh, cook something, maybe dust after you've eaten, vaguely gesturing towards the kitchen and our bedrooms. Angel and I remain at the door, staring until Beulah finally rises from the table and begins the housework at a stately pace. We should also say housework. <laughs> at a stately pace. Beulah doesn't work. <laughs> Beulah is no servant, she says sharply. For hours after Beulah has gone, I wonder how I should address her, as I'm as scared of her as I am of Barimami. 
Something builds up in Barimami and the Beulah wars begin. Barimami turns supervisor. You haven't tucked in the lower sheet. Beulah sucks her teeth, ignoring her. Barimami thunders at Angel, Mummy and me, following the following day, as if Beulah is not in the room. You know she sweeps around the furniture instead of moving it. You can't take shortcuts, you know. This has no effect on Beulah, who sits down for a cup of tea and leaves the dirty dishes in the sink. Barimami starts washing them with exaggerated slowness. Instead of being shamed, Beulah allows Barimami to continue working. Barimami's voice turns increasingly polite and supercilious. Would you mind, awfully, if you please, sweeping beneath the bed? If you, if you have time, between your other important work, of course. Come, Beulah responds coolly. I go see if I have the time. Come washing day, Beulah ruins several of Barimami's cotton saris by immersing them in bleach. My grandmother shoves them on the Beulah's face. Thank you so much for putting these spots on my saris. You want me to put spots on all? <laughs> Beulah responds. And just one more cap paragraph, I, I, and I'm I, going to wait, stop. I'm yeah. going to stop. I'm now. so sorry I've because it's on really for, fun. For too long. <laughs> I think but I'm we're nearly out of time, time actually. Mm. Uh, but I just wanted to ask that, that I, it, struck, it struck me when you when you describe how you got off the plane and that baptism of fire. Mm. It feels like you were, you were purified for, of all the stuff that had happened in India because it wasn't a happy time for you either, right? Mm. Because your um, the angel was next to God, yes. and you were sort of tolerated. Yes. So was this, this new world, this magical world, was it easy to embrace you for, as, as, a, as a new way to be as well? It was absolutely amazing. Mm. I think Tobago gave me a kind of freedom that I never had in India. And to see, and as children, you have no idea of race. So we had Mrs. Wheeler and, uh, of, of African descent living next to us, who became like a second mother. You had she Philippi saved your life, she basically. She saved my life. Mm. You had the Filipino people, you yeah. had the Chinese, you had, you had the, you know, the, I guess, the, the, the local whites. So it was literally uh, all the strands of continents in one place where it didn't matter where you came from or who, what, what, you, what religion you were. It was a new world where you could reinvent yourself. Mm. I think for you, because Barbara speaks of a slightly different experience of those different strands, right? And you did say it was a book about privilege. So it's interesting to see all those different strands knitted together and to see all these experiences writ large on a very, very large uh, uh, um, platform uh, in a huge world that was heaving. And it seems like the world is only heaving now, but the world has always been heaving. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> because we're all the flotsam and jetsam of that world. I'm so sorry that um, I was strictly forbidden from taking questions from the audience. Uh, I apologize, and I know that you've been waiting and wondering, is anybody ever going to ask you if you've got any questions? Mm -hmm. But the writers will be here. Um, we unfortunately have to end because sorry. this time has flown by, and I hope it's been as valuable and as wonderful and as magical as it's been for me, for you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.